great pleasure to be here. Um, as you said, I'm, I'm uh, using Portainer on a, on a daily basis. Um, the company I work for, Cosmo Consult, uh, we created a service that is um, setting this up uh, using Portainer, setting a service up using Portainer. I'm the CTO there, but also uh, leading a development team that is, is creating a containerized service. And there I'll try to um, show you what we're actually doing in a production environment. I don't want to make an, an update in a production environment live in a webinar. So um, I'll, I'll use a dev environment for that, but I'll, I'll certainly show you how it works in our production environment as well as um, how we, we do it uh, when the update actually happens. So basically to give you just an idea of what we're do doing, as I said, um, we are providing a, a containerized service. Um, this is used by our product development teams as well as the teams that are implementing our products on, on the customer side. So it's, it's both product development experts and um, project teams that, that are doing consulting, that are doing development, project management, and so on. And they are all using, using those services. And um, the reason why we're doing what we're doing with Portainer is that um, we are pushing out updates, but we don't want to update them um, without their consent, so to speak, because um, basically they might be right before a go live. They might be right before a, a critical um, release they are creating. So we don't want to um, make that change at exactly that moment, but allow them the control to make the change th themselves. So basically for all the, the companies that um, are using our services, they are able to make the decision themselves when they want to do the update. And um, until Portainer came out with that feature, we had like an, an explanation how they need to log on on which machine, what scripts they need, needed to run and so on. And it basically only took like five or seven minutes and, and it was kind of easy and it worked well, but still it felt like not an ideal way to do it. So we, we also looked into creating something by our own, but then we noticed that Portainer was planning to do something. We decided to wait for it and it, it actually works very well. So basically, the scenario is that that someone who is an administrator for one of the companies that is using our service, they want to go in and do an update for the service. What we as the development team that is creating that service are doing is we are pushing um, the definition into a, a Git repository so they can take it from there. And to show you what I'm talking about, I'll just going to log in to Portainer here. By the way, you can see the new SSO feature also. Um, that, that is also something that works great. So you can see this is a Docker Swarm. Um, it has roughly 100 containers that are up and running. So this is, this is one of our production environments. And if I um, select that one, I can select the stack because the feature that we're uh, looking at is a stack that is, is Git based um, in a Git based deployment. And you can see here, this is the stack that I'm talking about, the Docker automation stack. And if I click on that one, you can see um, the new uh, interface that is made for um, deploying a stack. And this is the interface, how it looks like if the stack is already deployed and I can do an update here. So you can see here that it is referenced in this particular Git repo hosted on GitHub. And I'll just copy and paste that and open it here. You won't be able to access this yourself. This is a, a private repo um, because this is, as I said, built on uh, building our own services. But here I have a stack folder, a Docker automation subfolder, and in here there is a Docker compose file. And that is used to define the service that we're creating. It has a couple of different services, the what we call Azure DevOps automation, then it has the Docker automation, it has agents for the Docker automation. Um, it has a lot of configuration. As you can see here, we're using traffic as a reverse proxy. We had a, have a lot of volumes that we're mounting. Um, we have environment variables, networks, and so on. So basically, it's a not terribly complicated, but also not trivial configuration file. Where we can store it on Git and then um, share it with the, the different companies that are using our services because they have access to the same repo as well. Now, if we do an update, Let's say we move the Azure DevOps automation from 0.11.25 to 0.11.26. We would make a change here. If we have um, the uh, Docker automation, move it from 0.11.17.12 to 0.11.18, we would, would make a change here. Just commit that, push that into the repo, and let everyone know that they, they can uh, use it. And what they then would do, they would go into Portainer. 
um, and then just click on pull and redeploy. They also need to authenticate. Um, I would need to put in a username and a password to do the re-authentication. And I'll show you in a second in our dev environment how this works. Um, also in a future version of Portainer, this will be stored by container. So you don't have to always uh, re-edit. But if I then click on pull and redeploy, it would download the version of the, um, of the Docker Compose file, the definition of the stack with the new versions, and then deploy um, the new versions of the, of the images into the stack, into our Swarm, and we would have the update uh, up and running. So basically, as I said before, the, the, the process that we had in place before required them to log into a VM, set up the SSH keys, uh, run a script, and so on. And, and again, it wasn't terribly complicated, but now it literally is a couple of clicks, um, pull and redeploy, and they are up and running again, and, and they have the latest version. So this is really great because um, on the one hand side, we can completely control the environments because everything is built on top of that um, Docker Compose file that is in the, in the Git repo. We always know what people are using. And for the local administrators who need to create the update, it, it really is only a couple of clicks entering a username and a password for now in the future that is even stored. And then we can very easily roll it out. Even if we do um, some canary deployments or um, sometimes we do a, a green blue deployment, then we could also enter a different branch here, let people have access to a preview release or a different version or whatever. And that also makes it very easy for us to have different kinds of configurations and different kinds of deployments to roll them out. Um, if I click on the editor here, you can see the exact same file. Um, so I also, if I want, can make manual changes here. But if I later go in here and say pull and redeploy, I'll do this once just to show you the message here. It tells me that any changes that I made locally will be overridden. So if someone even goes in here, makes a change, or we tell them to make a change because we want to test something or whatever, as soon as they do the redeployment, we always know they're in a clean state. They're on the same version that, that we want to have. So, so Tobias, this. This is an yeah. interesting feature because eventually um, if you're working in a, in a very secure environment where you do not have access to the Git repository for whatever reason, you can do changes manually and then eventually store them separately in a different file and, re and commit them later on to your proper Git repository if you want, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, this, this is very cool. This is very cool. Yeah. Something else that I'd like to point out is, as I said, it's it's all um, very, very similar, very standardized, but at the same time, there are, of course, differences between the different environments. To give you an idea what that looks like is if I go in here, you can see a couple of environment variables. For example, we need to know the name, we need to know the DNS. We have a configuration setting that knows whether this is something that is internally in our company um, or if this is something that we are providing for a customer. And then um, we have a, a cleanups thing that is, is uh, cleaning up images and that has uh, basically an amount of, of gigabytes when it starts running. So those are the kinds of configurations that you can have. And if we check back into the Git file, um, sorry, into the Docker Compose file in the Git repo, you can see, for example, here where such an environment variable is referenced. I'll try to make that a bit bigger. So. Um, this is the Cosmo internal environment variable. And in Portainer, I have that one set to true. So that means that when it's up and running, it should be set to true. Let's check. This was the Azure DevOps automation current service. If I go in here, take a look at the services. And there are a lot, so it's slightly slow. We have the Azure DevOps automation current service. And if I take a look at the environment variables, you can see here we have the Cosmo internal, which is set to true. So basically um, we have that option also to have a standardized way, but also to have it uh, configurable. So that way we, we can make uh, the necessary changes between the different environments, um, differentiation between production, non-production, differentiation between, uh, based on names and so on. And, and that also makes it very easy for us to make those kind of changes. So this is um, how it looks like as soon as it is deployed. You might also ask, how are you getting this into, uh, into the system um, initially? And there we can, of course, create a new stack. If I go to stack and say add stack, 
and then say git repo, I could um, put in all the information here. But when we create a new environment, we're using infrastructure as code um, tools, we're using Terraform, but you could use something else to be able to completely automatically update or create a new environment. And of course, we also want the deployment that you can see here to run um, completely automated. So basically, we're just running a script um, or, or running a, a build pipeline when we need a new environment and it's, it's fully automated. Um, that, that we have the full deployment. So we needed to find a way to do this initial deployment of the Git repo also in an automated way. And fortunately, um, Portainer has an API that we can use for this. And I want to walk you through the steps that we do to um, do that initial deployment. So what I'm going to do, to do here is I'm using um, Visual Studio Code and a, a plugin for that called REST Client, which allows us to do some, some REST calls in here. Um, this in, in reality, we're doing with a PowerShell script uh, because we, as I said, I want to run this automated, but to show you how it works, I'm just using um, the REST client so I can, I can explain what I'm doing. Um, the first thing that you need to do when you want to interact with an API is of course, you need to do authentication. For that, I'm calling the auth endpoint and the base URL you can see up here. This is where I can, I can reach the API. And for the authentication, I need a username and a password. I'll send the request. And as an answer, I get this uh, JWT token, which allows me to do the login. The next thing that I need to do in my specific case is I need the ID of the swarm. For that, I'm doing another call that you can see here. I'm um, sending a request to a specific endpoint and I'm asking it for the swarm information. Um, and if I send that one, I get an invalid token. That's not good. What am I missing? Oh, <laughs> I deleted something for clarity and I obviously deleted too much. Okay, sorry. That one is, is defining um, the token. I need this. Let me try again and try to get the swarm ID. Now I have it. So um, I'm sending this to, to that endpoint and getting the swarm information. Um, and part of the swarm information is the ID of the swarm. Now I have all information that I need and I can do the actual deployment. So what is now happening is that we're, we're deploying the stack. For that, I need the information um, that we've provided before. So to switch back to the GUI, you can see here, I need information like where is the repository? What is the branch that you want to use? Where can I find the file in, in the repository? What is needed for authentication? And I need to provide the same information um, for the API. So this is basically the path of the file in the repository, exactly as it says. I need a name. I need to tell it that I want to use authentication. Um, this is a variable that has my password. This tells it what branch I want to use. This is the repository. This is my username. And also I need to let it know the Swarm ID. Um, this is something that, that we've just created. And as you've seen before, we are also using environment um, variables and I can easily plug them in as well, as you can see here. So this is just an array where I put in the swarm name, the information, whether it's internal or not, the external DNS name and that cleanup thing that, that I mentioned before. So just, just to show you before I call it, um, I'll log into the test environment that I'm using here. And as you can see, we're using the business edition over here. Um, and I'll select it. It basically has almost nothing running. It only has that base stack, but not the, the Docker automation stack. And if I take a look at the service, it's only Portainer and then basically traffic in a, in a different Windows version. So if I now go back in here and make that call through the API to, to deploy my stack, to have that in an automated way, I'll send it. And this typically takes a couple of seconds. Let's see. And then at some point it will start to appear in here. Not yet. Those are always the interesting seconds in a live demo. Yeah, like, oh my God, is it going to work? <laughs> right. Yeah. Ah. And here we get the 200 OK. So it tells me, OK, I've created a stack called automation um, and all the information that I provided. And if we know, now go back in here, 
in the list of stacks. Now we have the automation stack. So I can take a look and now we have everything as, as defined previously. We have it in place, it works. Um, we have all the different services. We have all the different configurations. If I go back into the editor, you can also see that we have the, the uh, environment variables with the names and so on. Yeah, isn't, isn't it that isn't this cool? I mean, I think this this type of integration is amazing. It does yeah reduce the deployment time and also the fail safe deployment of stacks in yeah. an amazing manner. This is this yeah. is amazing. And I see yeah. that you're running this in the in a Windows environment, right? I mean, yeah. Um, and th this is something also that I think is really cool about Portainer, uh, regardless of what environment you're running on. If that is on a uh, the underlying environment is a Windows environment or a Linux environment. I mean, the interface is the same. The functionality is the same. You could be doing, actually, you could even be uh, at, at, at some point just obviously changing the proper parameters, migrating this to a proper Linux server if you needed to, right? Just by using this interface. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and the, the other dimension, of course, is, as I said, or you said, I think, and as people have seen, we're using Docker Swarm right now. But maybe in the future we'll move over to Kubernetes because I mean okay. the, it's it's kind of clear where the industry is going. Um, we have a couple of blockers and things we need to change to to be able to move there. But mm -hmm. one thing that we know we will just keep using as is, and the users will probably see almost no difference is Portainer because it exactly. just works the same. Exactly. Um, it's fine, and they they can just um, get easily up and running again, even if we um, change the orchestrator. Yeah, I'm going to show right after your demonstration how how this can be done with Kubernetes very quickly. And and, um, and again, the impressive thing about it is that the interface is practically the same, right? Yeah. There's hardly any difference with, actually there's a little added bonus when it comes to Kubernetes that I'll, I'll leave that as a surprise um, when, I, when I show that part on Kubernetes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, just one last thing that I wanted to show you now is, is actually the, the real update. We just deployed it, so there's no actual change, but just, just to show you how it would look like, I'll enter my username and I need to copy and paste my password. And then I can just say pull and redeploy, accept the update. And with that, it's just running. We won't see a change because um, it's exactly the same version as it, was, as it was before. But just to show you how easy this is, how easy it is for an administrator to, to fetch the update and get up and running again on a new version, it's, it's extremely simple. Um, as I said, right now they need to uh, input the username and the password, but that will change in the future as well. And then it's, it's really very, very simple for someone to do that deployment. And with that, we're already... Um, no, I don't want to update the password. Um, with that, we are already up and running. Um, uh, we have, we would have new versions if the the uh, definition in the Git repo would have changed. Right, Tobias, this is amazing. This is really, really cool. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm we, we got the exactly with... same feedback from our administrators. They were very happy when they yes, um, so understood they didn't need to fiddle with files and, and that kind of thing. And, that, and that's that's another really key thing about Portainer, right? There's no, there's hardly any code when it comes to using Portainer involved, unless obviously you have a YAML file, be that a Docker Compose or a YAML manifest on Kubernetes. Well, obviously that's 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 another story, but um, within Portainer per se, even the administration of your services and your containers, it's pretty much done everything using a, a, a graphic interface, right? And and very quickly and very not quickly, not only quickly, but in an easy manner and in a safe manner. So that's one of the key things I, th I really like about Portainer. What I also tried um, in the login here, because we are using OAuth, I tried to use an, an OAuth token um, with uh, Azure AD and that doesn't currently work. So at the moment you need to do a username and password based login, but I think that's also on the roadmap for the future. Yes. Um, yes. That, that is is something that you need to be aware of if you get started with the API and you're wondering how to log in and trying to use OAuth SSO with something like Azure AD, then this won't work for the moment. But um, yeah, as you can see here, it's it's not that complicated.